Wednesday, January 27th, 1993. We are in the town known as La Romana, which lies in the foothills of eastern Spain. The town itself is relatively small. The population has lingered at just around 2,000 for the past few decades. The area surrounding the town is pretty desolate, just small pockets of communities that string everything together via dark, winding roads through the Spanish countryside. Inside La Romana, everything looks just like a regular suburban town. But outside of the city itself, you might as well be living in the outback. The horizon is made up of many grassy knolls and hills, which serves a great addition to the area's very temperate climate. Gabriel Aquino Gonzalez is a retired farmer who is approaching 70 years old. In his retirement, he has taken up a number of hobbies, one of which is beekeeping. Gabriel kept his beehives on a nearby property belonging to one of his children's father-in-law. This in-law, a man by the name of Jose Sala, was roughly 15 years younger than Gabriel, but the two apparently got along pretty well. The two men parked their car at the end of a road. It was roughly 10 o'clock in the morning, so they wanted to let the sun warm up a little bit before approaching the beehives, which were located nearby the ruins of an old, abandoned house. Since they had some time to kill, Jose decided to sit for a moment and smoke a cigarette. The older Gabriel wanted to stretch his legs a little bit, so he went for a walk in the surrounding area. For about 20 minutes, Gabriel Aquino Gonzalez patrolled the nearby area, going around the two abandoned buildings that had once been homes. This is when something shiny catches the corner of his eye. Gabriel screamed out and began making his way back to the younger Jose, who met him halfway. He loosely described something that did not look right. Cautiously, the two men approached what it was that had freaked out the 69-year-old man. What they found were a loose collection of branches and shrubs, which had been gathered and roughly thrown over a trench of some kind. Someone had clearly dug a hole and used tree limbs and anything they could yank out of the ground to cover it up. Jose Sala just so happened to have an old spatula with him, which he had planned on using with the beehives. With this spatula, he poked at the bramble a bit, pulling back some of the twigs to see what was hiding underneath. He found the reflective item that had originally caught Gabriel's eye. It was a watch. A large one, in fact. However, Jose also discovered that the watch was not alone. It was still being worn by the person who had been wearing it two months beforehand. Roughly the time when three teenage girls had gone missing from not too far away, in a small, sleepy town called Alcacer. What Jose Sala and Gabriel Aquino Gonzalez discovered that day in La Romana would bring about a murder mystery for the ages. It was a story that would shock Spain to the core, and it would change the way an entire country approached similar cases. It is a story that has become fraught with conspiracy theories, rumors of police and political corruption, and endless amounts of speculation. This is the story of the girls from Alcacer. Hello, welcome to the Unresolved Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Whelan. This story, which is my first ever from a European nation, will be focused on the story which the Spanish media would forever title, The Alcacer Girls. This is one of those episodes that I'm sure might rub people the wrong way. Not only is it terribly graphic at times, fair warning, but it's also incredibly divisive. This is one of those cases where the official record of what happened doesn't quite line up with the evidence, and it's led to a lot of controversy in the years since. Also, this case became synonymous with trashy television news coverage in Spain in the 1990s. Pretty similar to what us Americans experienced with the John JonBenet Ramsey and O.J. Simpson scandals. So, with that being said, I hope you will all forgive me when I stumble upon pronunciations or poor translations. With this story, there are very few English language sources, so I'm relying on a lot of translated articles while having close to no working knowledge of the Spanish language. So, blanket statement, in advance I apologize for anything I may mess up. But now, with that being said, 
let's turn back the dial to the early 1990s, along the eastern Spanish coast, in a sleepy little town called Alcácer. Alcácer is a small town in the Spanish province of Valencia, with a population of just over 7,000. It sits about 15 kilometers southwest of Valencia itself, just another small town among dozens that speckle the grassy Spanish countryside. Several of these small towns are separated by just a kilometer or two, making them pretty easy walks during the daytime. Alcácer is very close to the eastern Spanish coast, just a 20-minute drive or so away. The area has a very long history that dates back beyond the Middle Ages. Ruins from Roman times have been discovered in nearby areas, and the evidence shows that perhaps even the ancient Germanic people once settled the area. However, in written history, the land has passed between Muslim and Christian rule over the centuries. Up until this point in the early 1990s, the municipality of Alcacer wasn't very renowned for anything at all. It was simply a small town in a storied area with scenic land surrounding it that made it prime real estate for hikers. Antonia Gomez Rodriguez was born in Valencia, Spain, on May 25, 1977. According to the records, she was the youngest of four children, and she was named after her grandmother. Growing up, she shared a room with her sister, Luisa, and was always close with her older brother, Fernando, with whom she often confided in. He also messed around with her constantly, occasionally calling her Antonia. You see, she wanted to go by her nickname of Tony, and any mention of her full first name drove her crazy. Tony was a very timid girl. Not in a bad way, but her friends and family always recall her as being very nervous, as if a strong gust of wind could suddenly scare her. However, she was also a very kind and compassionate girl. Her mother recalls a time when Tony had arrived home with a tiny kitten that she had found out on the street, and she allowed the pet to live with them. Tony would go on to care for that cat like it was her own child. At this point in 1992, Tony was apparently done with schoolwork, and she had stopped studying. She was simply waiting to turn 16, so that she could begin working and making money, which, of course, she was planning to spend mostly on clothes. Tony was always very conscientious towards the people she cared for, especially her parents. She was constantly calling home on the weekends when she knew that she would not be home on time, which stands at a pretty clear contrast with the events that would later unfold. Maria de Seda Hernandez Fulch, most commonly referred to as Desiree, was born almost a year after Tony, in February of 1978. She only had one sibling, an older sister named Rosanna. Growing up, Desiree became focused in on athletics, where she excelled. No matter the time of year, she was probably involved in some type of competition sport, where she was often coming in first or second place. When she wasn't competing for a medal or a trophy, she was often just skating around town. That was her favorite pastime by far, just skating around the area of Alcacer, talking to people, and showing off her extremely personable people skills. However, Desiree was not the most rigorous student. In 1992, she was 14 years old, and she was in the middle of repeating the 8th grade. People close to Desiree recall her as being very headstrong, with a defined personality that was fun-loving while also being stubborn. Many people also considered this a reflection of her very young age. Miriam Garcia Ibora was born on July 28, 1978, which was just a few months after Desiree. Unlike the two other girls, she was the oldest child in her family, with two younger brothers. These two younger brothers went to the same school as Desiree. Growing up, Miriam became known for her beauty. She had light brown hair and blue eyes, which caught the attention of almost every boy in her class. Miriam spent a lot of her free time focused in on ballet which was her greatest passion up to this point in 1992. At this point in time, Miriam was attending the nearby La Florida Institute, which was in the nearby town of Cataroya. This just meant that, unlike Tony, Miriam was planning to continue her education. However, since she had just started at the school, she hadn't had much time to make many friends, so she would often spend her weekends with her hometown friends from Alcacer. Like her friend Tony, Miriam was often shy and reserved, with a sensitivity that made her a fan of poetry, which she read as much as she wrote. She often shared her own poems with her friends, 
who would recall snippets months later. These three girls, who were all born in Valencia and grew up in the small town of Alcacer, would become friends. Despite the slight age gap, with Tony being about a year older than the other two, the three girls would grow close. They also had another friend, a girl named Esther Diaz Martinez. In November of 1992, Esther started to come down with a bug that kept her from hanging out with the other girls and going anywhere. Whatever she had come down with, most likely the flu, seemed to be going around, because it was the same sickness that Miriam's father, Fernando Garcia, had picked up a few days beforehand. On November 12, 1992, 15-year-old Tony called into the local 107.7 radio station and dedicated a song to a group of friends, which included Esther, Miriam, and Desiree. The song was Major Tom, not the David Bowie version, but the Peter Schilling song. Even though the call is in Spanish, I'll just go ahead and play it for you. During this call, the radio host, who went by the name Monfi, asks Tony what she's going to be up to over the weekend. She basically says that she doesn't know, but that she's not going to stay home. Tony's family would go on to cherish this audio recording over the next few decades, because her and her friends would go missing just a day later. And her comments about the upcoming weekend would go on to haunt an entire nation for years. It was Friday the 13th, in November of 1992, that the three friends, Tony, Desiree, and Miriam, would go missing. Desiree and Miriam had been at school throughout the day, while the older Tony apparently spent the afternoon with their other friend, Esther. At some point, Miriam came home from school, which got out at roughly 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and was seen by her parents. Her father, Fernando, was home sick with the flu and confined to bed. Eventually, all of the friends met up at Esther's home. As I said earlier, she was sick with a kind of bug, so she wasn't able to really hit the town with them, so to speak. But on a Friday night like this, they were planning to head to a party in a neighboring town. More specifically, to a nightclub called Kulor, where classmates of the girls were throwing a party. It was a fundraiser effort to raise funds for an end-of-the-year class trip. This nightclub, which has been referred to as a discotheque in all of the news articles about the case, was in a neighboring town called Picasent. Picasent is literally across the freeway from Alcacer. The two cities are neighboring municipalities of Valencia, and to get from the middle of Alcacer to the middle of Picasent would be just a few kilometers, equaling a few minutes of driving or roughly half an hour of walking. By all indications, the three girls were setting out to visit the Kulur nightclub. However, this has always been stated after the fact. Because sadly, we just don't know what the girls' true intentions were on this Friday evening. They set out from their friend Esther's home at roughly 8 o'clock that evening, and were seen by multiple eyewitnesses on their way to the Coolord nightclub, but they would never actually get there. More interestingly, the girls had neither money to spend at the club, nor did they have any pre-purchased tickets to enter the club. After all, these were teenage girls that had not entered the workforce yet. To get money, they would have needed to ask their parents for it, which none of them had beforehand. However, over the next few years, the working theory would be that the girls were trying to get from their hometown of Alcacer to a nightclub in the neighboring community of Picasent. And despite being seen less than a block away from the club, they never made it to this apparent destination. Several eyewitnesses saw the three girls on the evening that they disappeared, but the timeline is a bit scattered. As I said beforehand, the three girls had been at the home of their friend Esther, she recalled them leaving her house at around 8 o'clock in the evening, which would put them close to the edge of Alcacer at that time. Esther's home was located at the southwestern edge of Alcacer, which is one of the closest points to the neighboring town, Picasent. This is where the girls were headed. 
Apparently, the girls were spotted by an acquaintance of theirs earlier in the evening, which was close to the time that they left Esther's home. This acquaintance was a teenage boy who knew the girls in a somewhat familiar way. He was likely a classmate of theirs, but he knew the girls and he talked to them briefly. His name was Francisco Antonio Soria. Early in the evening, he was apparently on his way to a graduation exam, which I found odd. I'm not aware of many places that arrange for a major test to be taken on a Friday evening, but maybe this is just an odd translation or a cultural difference that I'm unaware of. While on his way to the exam, he came across the three girls. This put them closer to the center of Alcacer, but since this was earlier in the evening, it's most likely explained by the three girls being on their way to Esther's house. However, in Francisco's brief discussion with the girls, he asked them if they were going to the party at the Coulor nightclub that evening. According to his later testimony, which was given years after the fact, they told him no. This would stand at a pretty clear contrast with the later official statement. While I understand that it could be explained by them brushing him off or lying to him, I just find it a bit odd. So, apparently after this encounter, the girls made their way to their friend Esther's home and they stayed for somewhere between half an hour and 45 minutes. This is where the timeline starts to get very choppy. At around 8.15 that evening, which was around the time that Esther estimated her friends leaving, another acquaintance of theirs recalled seeing them sitting on the sidewalk a couple of blocks away. This acquaintance was an older boy named Francisco Jose Hervas, who was driving by with his girlfriend, Maria Luz Lopez Garcia. Francisco wasn't friends with the girls, but he was friendly with them and he offered to take them to wherever they were headed. The three girls, who seemed to be hitchhiking, told Francisco that they were headed to the Coulor nightclub. Francisco, whose car had a leak in the fuel tank, dropped the girls off down the street from the club, right in front of an auto repair shop that he was originally heading to. However, it's worth noting that when I say down the street, they were still a bit of a walk from the club. The repair shop that Francisco stopped at was on the eastern edge of Picasent, while the nightclub that the girls were heading to was on the western edge. Picasent is not a large town, so this would be a short walk, but it was still a few blocks away. Another eyewitness would see the girls walking down the main road that ran through Picasent, but this would have taken them directly to the nightclub itself. The most startling eyewitness testimony came from a completely unrelated source, who came forward just a few days after the girls were reported missing. Maria Dolores Badal Soria was a 63-year-old woman who saw the three girls walking by her home in Picasen. She estimated the time to be roughly 8 o'clock in the evening, which again, provides a pretty cluttered timeline for when everything happened. This older woman recalls seeing the girls get into a small four-door white sedan, even though they were just minutes away from their destination, the Calor nightclub. And according to this eyewitness, there were already a few men inside the white sedan. She recalls seeing at least three or four men inside the car, which proposes a truly unanswered question. How many people can you fit inside a small car? According to this testimony, seven people sped off in a white sedan, whose make and model Maria Dolores Badal could not recall. This would be the last time that the girls were ever seen alive. The mystery had begun. When the girls did not return home that evening, each of their parents became concerned. These parents, who were familiar with one another through the girls' friendship and small-town nature of Alcacer, met up the next day. That evening, at roughly 9.30pm on November 14th, the parents of the three girls reported them as missing, but the searches to find them would not begin until a few days later. By Monday morning, the 16th of November, the three girls had still not returned home their parents collectively knew that this was no accident. The girls would not have just run off together, especially considering they had no money or resources to make it very far. From the start, the viewpoint was that the girls had been kidnapped. Over the next week or so, police interviewed friends and relatives of the three girls, hoping for a clue that could point them to their whereabouts. This is when the Civil Guard collected almost all of the witness statements, including Maria Badal's testimony that the three girls had gotten into a white sedan with a handful of men. During this time period, the Civil Guard also discovered that the three girls had not even made it to their destination, the Kalur nightclub. Somewhere along the dark road that ran through Picasen, the girls had gone missing. 
Miriam's father would become the most public face of the investigation. A hard-working, heartbroken father, he began appearing on any radio or television show that would bring some publicity for the case. Just days after the disappearance of the three girls, he appeared on the television program, Who Knows Where, hosted by Paco Labaton. With him was the friend of the three girls who had been with them a short time before their disappearance, Esther Diaz-Martinez. The Civil Guard began utilizing their usual tricks, hitting up any local offenders who had been recently released from jail in Picasent. When this turned up with nothing, they expanded their search to include anyone in the surrounding area that had an applicable police record. Again, the result was nothing. After just a couple of weeks, the local area was alight with a desire to find the three girls. The city council of Alcacer printed off thousands of flyers to distribute, which contained pictures of Tony, Desiree, and Miriam. Despite receiving tips from all corners of the country over the next few weeks, and even expanding their search into the nearby areas of Granada and Pamplona, the Civil Guard were no closer to finding the three girls. In December of 1992, the search for the three girls continued to expand in size and scope. The interior minister of Spain began to become personally interested in the case, which was beginning to be covered throughout national media outlets. Under his supervision, a task force was set up as a joint effort between the Civil Guard and the National Police, which is an organization I likened to the FBI. This task force, referred to as the UCO, was known as the Unit of Central Operations. It would be centered in Valencia, the largest town nearby both Alcacer and Picasen. Word of the case managed to make its way all the way up to the president of the Spanish government, Felipe Gonzalez. On Christmas Eve of 1992, he received the families of the three missing girls and heard their pleas, promising to attribute more forces to the search in hopes of a quick resolution. The search expanded to neighboring nations, even neighboring continents. The case was forwarded to Interpol, who began to add nearby European and African countries as potential places of interest. That Christmas Eve also marked another relevant episode of Who Knows Where, which contained interviews with the girls' family members in their homes. Miriam's eight-year-old brother, Martin, delivered a heartfelt handwritten plea to anyone who might know the whereabouts of his older sister. At this point, Miriam's father, Fernando Garcia, had quit his job and was pursuing answers regarding his daughter full-time. Over the next month, he was planning to visit multiple news agencies in countries all over Europe, including the BBC and Sky News. He was even trying to arrange a face-to-face -face meeting with Pope John Paul II in an effort to spread the story of the three Alcacer girls to churches and chapels all over the world. This case would continue to be at the forefront of the Spanish media for the next few weeks. And of course, during the short time period that Fernando Garcia was out of the country to spread the word of his daughter and her missing friends, their bodies would be discovered. Beekeepers Gabriel Aquino Gonzalez and Jose Sala discovered the bodies of the three girls on January 27, 1993. This was more than two months after the initial disappearance, and they were found close to 150 kilometers south in the sleepy, hilly village of La Romana. From the get-go, the unearthing of the bodies was marred by incompetence. It took the local magistrate, Judge Jose Luis Bort, several hours to make it to the site of the bodies in La Romana. He was already overseeing the excavation of another body in a neighboring area. Plus, when the two beekeepers found the dumping site, they originally believed the exposed hand to be that of a man, so nobody was in a big rush to make it to the crime scene. That afternoon, Judge Jose Bort made it to the area, along with his judicial secretary, Angelis Fon Cuayado. She would become relevant later on, eventually becoming the judge that would oversee the trial against the case's main suspect. It's also worth noting that on this day, January 27th, the Ministry Interior had decided to replace the team in charge of the local task force responsible for finding the girls. 
So early in the day, the team that had been located in Valencia overseeing the search was sent back to Madrid and was being replaced by another squad, led by Captain Francisco Bueno. This squad, referred to as the UCO, also contained Lieutenant Jose Dominguez, who would share sharp words about the investigation decades after the fact. It just so happens that on the one day that the UCO wasn't present in the area, the bodies were found. And the excavation of the bodies, which occurred without the supervision of the UCO, would be so bungled that it would derail the investigation possibly forever. The bodies of the three girls, Tony, Desiree, and Miriam, were found in a large pit, which had been dug months beforehand. The three bodies, which were found in various stages of decomposition, were found stacked on top of one another. Judge Jose Luis Bort, the magistrate in charge of the excavation of the three bodies, declared the endeavor a secret one. This forbid the two beekeepers that discovered the bodies from speaking to the media or anyone for that matter and kept anyone from approaching the crime scene without the necessary oversight. However, the crime scene was locked down hours after the discovery of the bodies, allowing the integrity of the scene to be compromised. The excavation of the scene was done so almost immediately. Nobody at the crime scene took photos of the scene itself or conducted an exhaustive search of the area before digging the bodies and the evidence out of the pit. Over the years, this has struck many as being very odd. Normal police protocol throughout the world is to take photos of a crime scene before removing or even touching anything. In this individual case, the police and first responders decided to tamper with the scene before taking almost any photos whatsoever. There was a single standalone photo taken of the scene as it was found, but all you can really see is a blob of dirt and mud. They didn't bother going through the evidence as they were digging it out or taking a video, which they very easily could have done. The bodies were then pulled out of the pit, and police apparently discovered that they had been wrapped up in some kind of large, greenish-brown rug. Two of the girls had been decapitated, and their hands were bound by black rope of some kind. However, along with the bodies, several items were discovered inside the pit. They were unrelated pieces of clothing, bits of rope, pieces of paper, basically garbage. It's worth noting that just like the bodies, police took photos of these individual items after they had already been pulled out of the pit. So we have no idea how to clarify how they were found, whether they were discovered underneath the bodies, among the bodies, on top, etc. These items were assorted afterwards and then photographed together, with several of them not even being collected as evidence. A few pieces were apparently just left behind at the scene. However, police would go on to use one individual item from that crime scene to be the linchpin of their upcoming investigation. One item with an unknown origin that may have been discovered either within the pit or simply nearby. Police testified to the latter, but with no photographic evidence to support their claim and the clear incompetence on the part of the first responders. This has become challenged by many in the media in the decades since. However, one thing was for sure. The discovery of the three bodies. Those of Tony Gomez Rodriguez, Desiree Hernandez Fulch, and Miriam Garcia Ibora would change the country of Spain forever. Thank you.